Okay, Hugo is going to start off by telling us something about the history of uh, the medical applications of physics. Okay, Hugo, ready to go? So, uh, we are doing here fundamental physics at CERN, but people were doing it many years ago, 125 years ago. A central gentleman, which is appearing in the first uh, picture, Mr. Röntgen, made a discovery which uh, changed physics and medical physics. This is the discovery of X-rays. Can we have the first image? Okay. Let's see if we can see it. This is the first one is Mr. Röntgen, and he did the first radiography. These are X-rays 125 years ago. The start of medical physics, by chance discovery which changed both physics and medicine. The next picture shows you what it is today, the use of X-rays in the therapy of cancer. We need, in this case, accelerators, LINAC, linear accelerators, electrons which hit the target and produce a beam of very collimated X-rays which treats patients rotating around the bed where the patient is laying. Next, I'll show you what happened a few day, years later, the discovery in 96, 98 of natural radioactivity. There are nuclei and uh, are the center of the atom which uh, disintegrate naturally producing particles. This is called radioactive isotopes. Mr. Becquerel and Marie and Pierre Curie discovered the first uh, isotopes, radium. Marie Curie, we shall hear later on, is the great lady of physics. She got two Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry and one in physics, with the discovery of natural radioactivity. Then, few, many years later, 35, 34, there was the discovery of artificial radioactivity. Man can produce isotopes which disintegrate, produce particles which can be used. And the discovery was made in Paris, by Irene Curie, the daughter of Marie Curie, and her husband, Jean-Frédéric Joliot, and in Rome by Enrico Fermi and collaborators. Natural radioactivity was superseded by artificial radioactivity. And the next uh, image shows you then uh, by making use of the invention of Ernest Lawrence, another Nobel Prize winner, the cyclotron, a machine in which the particles are accelerated on the, a spiral orbit, one could produce at uh, will these new isotopes, artificial isotopes. So what was before natural became artificial and with accelerators, we can now produce in quantity the isotopes, radioactive isotopes we need. And so this is the way in which Medical radioactive nuclei are now produced in the world. You know, everybody knows that nuclear reactors are used for producing energy, but not many people know that they are used to produce radioactive nuclei. There are millions of people who are examined, diagnostic is made of their diseases with a nuclei which are radioactive, produced either in nuclear reactors, which are very big, or in cyclotrons, which is a uh, long, uh, uh, very long time built machine for accelerating particles. And with this nuclei, for some with this nuclei, we can make new diagnostic uh, analysis. And this is the, this next picture PET images, positron emission tomography. You can see maybe on the left figure that on the left arm there is a black point. Unfortunately, this is a cancer. And with the same examination by PET, uh, after two months uh, chemotherapy, the black point has disappeared. And the same, of course, fortunately, is still true after four months. So you can see that these people that I showed you uh, were looking for fundamental uh, questions. They are doing fundamental research. They discover things, radioactivity, uh, X-rays, they invented things, cyclotrons, other accelerators, and they, just by following up this development, became medical instruments. And when you go to an hospital, you find only physics around you. 
I could not speak about many other techniques. Recently, these developments have brought us to a new frontier, and this is the new frontier which we call hadron therapy. You see, uh, if you take a beam of protons, the nuclei of hydrogen, or of carbon uh, ions, which are the nuclei of carbon atoms, which has six electrons, you accelerate them, you send them in a body, you see that uh, the energy they leave is maximal at the end. They give a lot of those energy deposited at the end of their uh, path in matter. So they can treat a tumor target, which is indicated in the figure with this line, better than anything else. In fact, in the next picture you see the difference between protons and uh, uh, carbon ions and uh, X-rays. You see on the top there is a tumor embedded in the body. If you send protons or carbon ions, they stop in the target and they don't touch the tissues which are behind, while instead X-rays, by their nature, developed a, a dose which is all along the target. So, hydrons, protons and carbon ions are better suited for treating tumors. And now we are building, and in Europe we have a big project on these lines, accelerators, also in other countries, of course, in other uh, regions of the world, cyclotrons, which I mentioned are these spiralizing uh, accelerators for proton uh, and uh, what we call synchrotrons for carbon ions. A synchrotron is a machine in which the particles go around in an orbit and the, the famous LHC that was so much told about today is a synchrotron of very special uh, dimensions, as you know. In the case of uh, activity for medical uh, users, uh, the synchrotrons are much smaller, maybe uh, 25 meter in diameter. So, as you can see, also the latest development in accelerator fundamental physics uh, have brought uh, to applications which are novel and which uh, will be applicable to about 10, 15 percent of all the people who get X-rays. Imagine that today, and this uh, is my last word, today <coughs> there are out of 10 million people, 20,000 people who are treated every year with X-ray, 20,000 out of 10 million people, and about 10, 15% of them would get a better cure if we were using for them protons, and in the case of very resistant tumors, carbon ions. And this is a project in which CERN and a lot of European centers have been involved, as others in the world, in the last 10, 15 years. Okay, thank you very much, Hugo. Come and sit down. Come and sit down. Okay, we also have with us this evening Manjit Dosanj. Manjit is uh, CERN's life science advisor. What on earth does a life science advisor do at CERN, Manjit? An interesting question. I, what you've heard from Ugo is that what has happened in the last hundred years from particle physics discoveries to where we are with some of the cutting edge technologies for medical applications. Now, in order to go from the physics into the applications, sometimes it can take a long, long time. In x-rays, it took only two weeks before the first x-ray was taken. But for example, magnetic resonance imaging, it can take about 50 years from a Nobel Prize in physics to a Nobel Prize in medicine. So what the life science advisor does is try to bridge the various communities of what the needs are in the medical community and what the technologies are that are being developed in the physics. And how do you get them to collaborate, work together, and try to deal with issues which are emerging or already persistent? So what the advisor does is make bridges, collaborate, and make multidisciplinary platforms. Okay, I think Manjit, you have some of your collaborators with you this evening, is that right? That I do indeed, so I'm very fortunate for that. And one of the things that you've seen already from this these examples is it clearly particle therapy, hormone therapy that Ugo uh, has just, just discussed is really a multidisciplinary field. It's yes. a new field and we need new young people who can become our future scientists in this platform. And uh, also uh, Ugo mentioned Marie Curie is one of our early pioneers and these researchers 
are funded by a Marie Curie uh, training project called Partner. Okay, so would you like to invite one of them up and uh, Kate will go and uh, have a chat with them? Uh, yes, please. So we'll have, there's Daniel Abler over there, I can see. So, Daniel, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, my pleasure. So, in fact, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Where are you from and what are you doing here at CERN? So, I'm from Germany. I studied physics in Germany and I joined the partner program, which Manji is coordinating, last year. Um, so, we are um, several people at CERN and two of us are working, well, three of us actually are working on a project with is more health informatics rather than informatics for computing. Nevertheless, we would like to use some of the technologies which have been developed um, for the analysis of the CERN experiments um, for connecting clinical centers and sharing clinical information. Okay, and what first interested you in this particular field, this particular subject? Um, I like the fact that it is very multidisciplinary, as was mentioned before and that it tries to bridge several physics aspects with biology, with medicine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this was interesting for me. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Now, you have a number of your colleagues here. I wonder if we could get a few more of you up on stage. I Daniel, stay with us, stay with us, sit down. Stay with us, exactly. And uh, I can see two of you there, if you want to come up, Till and Sylvia. So thanks again for joining us tonight. Hello. Thank you. So um, what, are, what are some of the most enjoyable things about working here at CERN on a Marie Curie program such as this? Till. Well, I think one very nice thing is that you get uh, very fast in contact with a big part of the community. So you're not only here at CERN, but we actually do travel a lot. So it was for a field which is spread out, which uh, have different points as bio and biology involved, you have clinical facilities, and in this project they are all connected, so we get the chance to get to know quite some different parts. Okay. S Sylvia, how about you? What has been uh, one, of the, one of the highlights so far? Um, working here at CERN um, allows you to meet a lot of people from, uh, very, that are very, um, Mm, that know very well the, their fields and um, what uh, he said that uh, we travel a lot and we can visit facilities and uh, know about other fields related with radon therapy. So. Okay, one of the features of this particular training program is that the training extends quite wide. It, it teaches you all sorts of, of skills for, for beyond, is that right? Are you, yeah. are you doing a, a wide variety of training? Or? I was really impressed by the radiobiology course because uh, I'm a physicist, mm -hmm. so it was the first time for me that I could see DNA and uh, how the radiation could damage the DNA. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's quite impressive and it also makes you work for... Okay. Where are you from, by the way? Where are you from? I'm Spanish. You're Spanish, yeah. Until? Interesting accent. I come from Germany. So uh, what's nice about uh, the European projects that Manjit is working on is that it's really bringing together a lot of Europe and a lot of, a lot of young researchers uh, with different disciplines. It's lovely. So I think you have even some more colleagues in the audience. Do, do the remaining colleagues want to come up? Okay, we have one Romanian and one Canadian, Manjit has told me. Okay. So guess who's the Canadian and who's the Romanian? <laughs> uh, I admit to being the Canadian. Okay, <laughs> fine. So Hi what's everyone. your name? Uh, David, David Watts. David Watts. And what do you do, David Watts? Um, I'm an applied physicist. I'm working with uh, Professor Amaldi. Hold the microphone a bit. So I'm working with Professor Amaldi and um, we're building detectors for diagnostics for these medical applications. So we'd like to see uh, different aspects of uh, involved in for doing treatment planning for these kind of, um, uh, for these treatments. Uh, of cancer therapy, um, looking at the emergence of other particles that come out of the body to know exactly where the dose goes inside the body so that we can be precise. So you're a hardware specialist, are you? Uh, yes, we do a lot of different things. Okay. Guess, at the same time. What interested you to come and work in this particular field? Um, Why well, did you do it? 
I think having done a lot of physics and things for, for different years, um, which don't always have a very clear application, uh, it was a very exciting opportunity to do something that really, I think, that touches people and uh, has anyway a very clear goal for what we want to do, something that's applicable in the real world. Because you can see the usefulness of the physics. Exactly. Well, yeah. That's the title of our little section yeah. here. And your colleague here, could you pass the, oh, you've got the microphone. Yeah. What's your name? Uh, my name is Faustin Laurenti Roman, and uh, I'm from Romania. Okay. And what do you do? Uh, I work with uh, Daniel and uh, Vasiliki Kanelopoulos. We work at CERN for building a platform for connecting hadron therapy centers. So basically what we are doing is uh, we are using grid technology, which is um, an information technology which uh, allows you to, to connect the centers and share data in the same way that uh, experiments here at CERN are sharing their data. What is we the are grid? dealing with medical data. So What's the grid? Uh, so what is the grid? Uh, the grid is a... Um, it's, it's a way to, to share information and also analyze it. Uh, and it's uh, specifically meant for, for problems which are not easy to solve in one center. So that's why you need uh, resources spread all, or, all over the world, so in Europe and also in America. And that's why you, 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 you put people together, both in Europe and America, and you can share the data and analyze the data in a collaborative way. So the key word is collaboration again. So the grid is a large network of computers. It was built, designed for the analysis of the LHC data. For example, Atlas, which is just across the road here, they're using the grid for the analys analysis of their data. But it's also used in other fields as well. And very importantly, medicine is one of them. Exactly. Grids is a tool for connecting resources, but also people, and to, to, to bridge uh, disciplines. So what we are trying to do in our project is to, to bring together biologists, physicists, medical doctors, and to share the data and make a better treatment. Okay, I think it's time to have some questions. If anybody in the audience would like to ask any of these young people anything about the work that they do, or if you would like to ask Hugo or Manjit anything about the things that they've talked about, now's your big chance. Sophie has the microphone. So any questions, anything about medical physics or? Medical physics, okay. Or what CERN is doing? <laughs> Yes, we have one. Somebody's decided to ask a question, I think. Um, are you able to say how close to, um, uh, to being readily available the, the Hadron therapy technology is? I think that's one for Hugo, yes? How close to being ready to be applicable is Hadron therapy? That's what she's asking. Well, there are two types. One is with protons and the other one is with carbon ions. Protons is a long story. By now, 60,000 patients have been treated with protons. They are more precise than X-rays and uh, they, according to what comes out from the program that uh, Manjit is coordinating, we call it N-Light, or which part and is a part. According to this data, about 10% of all the people who now get uh, X-rays, given the fact that we have now enough data, should be treated with protons. So protons are certainly better than X-rays, and for 10% of the tumors which are close by to critical organs, organs which cannot be irradiated without uh, making the quality of the life of the patients quite bad, they should be treated with protons. Different is the situation of carbon ions, the other type of hadrons used, because in this case, they have the property of a very high efficacy, but they need to be carefully controlled. About 5,000 patients have been treated with carbon ions, and so this is a novel thing, and Europe, I must say, also because of CERN and GSI in Darmstadt, is now getting at the frontier. The Japanese have two centers running, and in Europe, there are 
one center is running and the second one is starting now. And this will be a lot of clinical trials for treating tumors which cannot be treated neither with X-rays nor with protons. So for one part, it is well advanced, people can buy it. The other part is still clinical studies. And Europe, we think, we hope, we are giving us the challenge to do it, we bring, I think, quite a lot of uh, good information to treat better radioresistant tumors. I think Manja is dying to say something. No, actually, one of the things I wanted to say is part of this European platform we are talking about, where partners, one of the funded projects, is precisely for the fact that Europe is leading the field. And Ugo has said that in Heidelberg they started treating patients already last year and Pavia should start treating some soon. But we want to make sure that other places in Europe where one, where they would like to or aspiring to are building centers, that they already have their training uh, both in terms of uh, treatment planning or imaging but also in terms of radiation oncology. So when they get a center, they will be able to start treating patients straight away because they get the expertise within the network and they will be ready to start from day one and not have to wait for a long time for the training. Okay, thank you. Anybody got a, a question? So there's another question over here. Do we have Sophie with the microphone? Sophie with the microphone. We'll take one of these microphones. Yeah. Where's the question? Uh, just over here. Where? You know, I saw once in Fermilab um, Center, in the Fermilab itself, and they treated uh, cancer as well. What kind of uh, um, X-ray do they use there? Fermilab started very early to treat patients with another type of hadron, the neutron. The neutron is one of the components of the, uh, of the nucleus. It is neutral, and uh, we call it neutron therapy. And today, the number of patients treated with neutrons is going down because it has been found that uh, the only few cancers are sensitive to neutrons without uh, damaging effects uh, for the healthy tissues. So it is a technology which is only concentrating on some cancer salivary glands. While instead, as I mentioned, protons are much more widely used and have a other wide spectrum of cancer as targets. So we've got a question from the internet here. Um, this question comes from Jane Karen from Auckland, New Zealand. And she's asking how feasible medical physics and diagnostic tools are for developing countries and countries that are just starting their, um, to get to join the first world in their health centers. Wow, that's a question from Auckland, New Zealand. Yep. What's the time in Auckland, New Zealand? Strange. Anyway. So, about, I think it's seven in the morning. Okay. Okay, uh, maybe I can try to answer this a little bit because I, I just was, uh, we were teaching African physics school in Stellenbosch. I know South Africa is not a developing country, but we had physicists from all over Africa and the idea of trying to do what we try to do is that, yes, they are a little bit behind about developing new techniques, but the medical physics and the collaboration between physics and other fields is a great collaboration network for them to work together and start making progress. And certainly in Latin America, in Colombia, Brazil, and Mexico, they are uh, already starting and using particle therapy, not necessarily to treat patients, but having particle therapy to have collaborations between accelerators, detector physicists, grid people, to start doing technology advancement together. So as a training platform. Yeah, just a little advertisement for CERN. Uh, CERN has four strategic missions, one of which is fundamental research, which I guess you would guess. Another is training the scientists of tomorrow, well, we have our young people on the stage here, our Marie Curie fellows. Third mission is transferring technology. So using the techniques that we develop at CERN to 
pass on to the outside world and medical physics is a fantastic example of that. And the last one is bringing nations together, working towards a common goal. And you can see, we won't count the number of different nationalities we are, have on stage this evening, but there's probably one, two, three, maybe there's already eight different nationalities on stage, all from CERN. Okay, so I'm still waiting for Silvano to tell me whether we're going to go now to some astroparticle physics, but Hugo would like to have a final word, yes. Maybe final is too much, but I wanted to underline a bit the title of this uh, part of the program. Physics is beautiful and useful. This is my motto since 20 years, and I'm happy to bring it home because we have heard a lot about the beauty of physics. I mean, of course, understand the universe, the first instance, uh, to see what will happen in 50 million e billion years from now is wonderful. It opens our minds. But automatically, automatically, when you try to answer the question that beautiful physics poses to us, automatically you develop instruments and methods which can be used in many other fields, in particular, as you heard tonight, in medical physics. And so the two words, which also make a rhyme in English, but not in Italian, in French, in Romanian, they are clearly related, useful and beautiful. I mean, and if you carry back this message and you tell around the people, and next time you go to an hospital, you look around and you see how much physics is helping you to solve the problems of health of yourself and of your dears, I think you'll be understanding why CERN is a very important place in the world. Thank you, Hugo. Um, can somebody tell me whether we are... Yes, we have a question, another question? Yeah, sure. Sufi, we have another question at the front. Um, I'd like to ask the, um, uh, the Curie fellows if um, they can identify any part of their education that's, um, that inspired them or that's led them here. Um, or that made them want to become physicists? I, I think for me, um, a starting point was uh, just to do something with a direct connection where I see that there's some use in the world and uh, that uh, the advances in this field actually change our daily lives and uh, some improvements have a direct impact on people's lives. So I think. This was one of the driving things for me. Okay, why not uh, pass it on? Uh, I think curiosity was always for me something natural. And so I guess uh, being a scientist was natural also. So, voila, here I am. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. I always uh, wanted to know how things are working. Uh, in that process, I've uh, damaged many radios and many clocks, but I also learned a lot, and uh, now I'm able to also fix them and maybe improve them. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is the, we'll wind up our session on the usefulness of particle physics. Thank you very much to our guests. Thank you to Yugiro, Malmjit, and our Marie Curie fellows. And I think it's now time to change completely and talk about astroparticles. Okay, we're going to show a clip. And here in Pavia, in the north of Italy, CNAO, the National Center for Oncological Adron Therapy, is getting ready to receive its first patients. This center is a European model of technology transfer directly from physics labs to medicine. Here, technologies developed for the exclusive use of physics labs like CERN in Geneva are applied directly to patients to the cure of cancer. L'idea di fare questo centro nasce dal professor Ugo Amaldi. Professor Ugo Amaldi had the idea of creating this center. Since 1992, he made great efforts to find new ways to cure patients, thanks to physics. La physica anche impossibilità di curare le persone. Qui siamo nella sala di controllo del CNAO. This is the control room of CNAO in Pavia. From here, we run the synchrotron. 
The average age today in Canal is pretty young. Most people are under 30. And here we are in the pulsating heart of Canal. It's synchrotron, the machine used to generate the particle beams that will kill the tumor cells. It's exactly the same machine as those used in particle physics labs at CERN in Geneva. We can see here one of the particle sources. It contains a plasma of protons and carbon ions that are accelerated by a potential of 24,000 volts to be inserted into the synchrotron circuits and later be shot on the patient. Sixteen dipole magnets like this one force the particles into a circular trajectory by generating a vertical magnetic field right here. Then we have 24 quadrupoles like this one that are used to squeeze the particle in the center of the vacuum chamber to make a perfectly collimated beam. The last component to close the circuit is this 20-ton betatron. It is used to extract the particles from the synchrotron into the treatment rooms. Questo acceleratore di particelle. You could say that the canal's accelerator is the LHC's little brother. It produces carbon ion beams at 4.8 GeV, clearly much lower than the LHC's energy range. But although much smaller, this accelerator is still very complex, as it's used to treat patients peculiarità che lo caratterizzano come acceleratore che nasce per trattare pazienti. Al termine di questa linea of the beam line, there's a patient, not a detector. Il progetto nasce The project was conceived in research laboratories such as CERN in Geneva, INFN's Frascati National Laboratory in Italy, GSI in Darmstadt, Germany. Dove queste tecnologie sono In these laboratories, these technologies have been used for a long time to study fundamental physics. In these research centers, we acquired the know-how to use these technologies for a medical project. The origin of the project is the PIMS Proton Ion Medical Machine Study at CERN. At CERN, we developed a number of special components of the synchrotron, such as fast magnets for tune measurement, beam injection and extraction, and magnet septi that inject beams into the synchrotron and extract them from the synchrotron to the treatment rooms. The secret of our success is that we've been able to create a collaborations network. First and foremost with the INFN, whose expert gave us an essential support to start now. The model of Canal is now being exported abroad, for instance to Austria by Medostron, but also to France. These new centers collaborate with us to replicate the Canal model elsewhere.